Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of National Cycling Podcast, where three cycling nerds discuss what's been happening in the week of cycling and also with an eye ahead, especially this week, because we've got Tour of Flanders coming up. But nevertheless, I'm joined by Mr. Krog himself, Ewan Wilson, and Patrick Blake of Audi Cycling. And I mean, guys, uh, yeah, where do you want to start? We've got Pogaccia dominating Walter Catalonia, Mess Pilsen beating Match Vanderpool this week, and uh, yeah, E3 as well. So take your pick. My word, I don't know. Um, what's, what's juiciest? I think let's talk about E3. Wow, and Vanderpool and all that carnage that went on. I mean, the most tragic part of that whole race is that Betty or DNF, obviously, that will have been the tragic news for, for you. And um, as he was watching, I'm sure he probably turned it off at that point. <laughs> and, I don't know. I think it was, it was an interesting race. I mean, Wow was. I don't know, he seemed to be playing a different kind of game this year. Like, is it just me as well? Just, like, kind of following Machu around, letting him do the stuff, and then that seems to be his game plan this year. And uh, obviously it didn't work out because, I mean, Wout was scuppered by a guttering, very sadly, on the path to Bogmat did deny as possibly quite a good fight, but I still stand by the fact that I think that Vanderpool would have probably beaten him anyway. He just seemed a little bit stronger, but the kind of ominous thing is that Vanderpool seems to be just on a completely different plane to anybody else. No poggy going to Flanders. Well, then yeah, well, we'll get out to that. We'll get out to that. <laughs> I don't know. I, I just think that Vanderpool seems like if when po- I mean Poggy's not going to Flanders, so therefore he seems pretty unbeatable. To be honest with you, like, I'm not. Even, I'm, I'm really not sure if this Melissa Bike's whole dominating team is really working out. To be honest, yeah, I, I think I think so far in the classics, with, well, I mean. This week in the classics, they had they didn't look as strong as, as they were like in the opening weekends. Well, we had those races there, but um, uh, E3 was was interesting. I always think E3 is one of the better classics. We've had some great narratives come out of that race in, in, in the past, and this year, I mean, once Vanderpool went, there was no stopping him. Wow, had that sort of adrenaline rush where he got to about twelve seconds behind Vanderpool, but then the elastic snapped, then it went up to like thirty seconds very quickly, and from that point, it just felt like I mean, there was no point really watching it. I, I sped watch it. I saw I saw Vanderpool attack, the gap went up, and I was like, boom, watching it at like four times speed because it it, it really just was like like an inevitable uh, finale there. But there were some decent performances all round. Uh, Bidim Grimai is, is definitely looking better. Uh, he didn't top 10 the race, but he was up there on quite a lot of the climbs. Oyal Kano as well looked particularly good. Jonathan Arvaez impressed me on that race. And um, yeah, Jesper Sturven got second place beating Wild Vanar in a sprint. That's always good to see. Proves my theory that Wild Vanar doesn't like reduced sprints. It, you would score a point though. I, it's kind of he do. He seems to just it's kind of like Kryptonite. You do think, oh wow, Vanar's here. It's like a guaranteed like win, but when was the last time we really saw Wout Van Aert winning like a sprint? Like we all think to he's won a sprint on the Champs Elysees, but oh, Pat Van Nocky last year, the the one day race in the autumn, he won a sprint that, and uh, he beat Hoggy and Mathieu back at Idri last year as well. Yeah, that's true. He's not like a guaranteed success if he's like one on one with somebody at the end of a classic. It's it's not. It's definitely not like a guarantee. Just like Wild Art's beating them, I don't think that's the case. But he seemed to be like bonking, like he literally just seemed to just be like pedaling really lightly on the pedals when that group was coming back to him. When Stoyven was bridging, it looked like he was maybe just like, okay, Stoyven's going to catch me. I'm just going to ease up and be ready to get on his wheel. But he didn't even like contest the sprint at the end. It was like he just didn't. He just didn't care. Maybe just like. To be fair, he was probably a bit demoralised with the day, just like falling on the Paterberg and thinking about what could have been in the day. You know, he was probably just like, ah, oh, second, third, I don't really care too much. But yeah, I think Stoyman's looking really good. I mean, obviously his teammate Pedersen also did really well oh. winning again, Devil Gun and the, the, the real six monument for those people out there who actually want to discuss about six monuments. But yeah, Lidl Trek looking actually really strong at the moment, to be fair. Would you say that Lidl Trek's classic squad is better than this Melissa bikes at the moment? No. But in terms of results, I think that one of the more effective classics teams. Scoinch got top 10, Alex Kish got top 10 the other day as well, and Idri, Pace, and Similia 
was right up there in the mix. Stoven came way well as well. Milan was in top six and Pearson took the overall win. So they're definitely punching above their weights and Squinch got podium on Strada Bianca recently as well. In San Remo, they were in fourth place there. I think they're sort of the team that's performing the best with their resources in the classics this year. I think on paper, Visma's team is stronger. I think they probably are stronger in like a sort of Man on man and classic situation, like we had it on Le Penny's Blatt. But the Lidl are definitely building on confidence. It was good to see Milan right up there towards the end of him, Abel Cam in particular. Well, they've been, well, I know Jonathan Milan's been added to the team as well, but it's been fairly consistent that team in terms of personnel. Stoven, Pills, Scrooge, uh, Alex Kirsch as well for a few number of years as well. So that could be something about it as well, knowing each other. Yeah, and they've worked closely as well. Ish, Sturm and Pierce to be a good sort of sprinting lead out for the past four years now. So they've, they've been working very closely for uh, for a couple of years. That's All right. What? Spoilers. So uh, Tom Squarrange in an interview is going to be on the second game extra. And there he actually said, for him, it doesn't really matter about a victory. He said it's as well as Mass Pilos winning as him winning. So he's like, I don't really care about me winning. It's about the team winning, which I think is, yeah, a really good mentality for a team to have. Yeah. And I think that this team does have good morale. They usually keep riders on for a long time. I think it definitely shows that they're doing something, something good and that they are building this year. They've been performing very, very highly uh, across all different kinds of terrain, apart from Tio Gegenhardt. Oof. Yeah. They're not all terrain. <laughs> yeah. I was a bit sore, isn't it? But I mean, um again, welcome. That's the freshest one. It's the last one finished a few hours ago after the recording. And uh yeah, what did you guys make of this? We did the recap and I mean Maspil isn't taking a second get welcome. But there is that sad stat that uh there hasn't really been a Gent Wilbergen winner in recent years go on to win the Tour of Flanders. So, Mets Pills and fans, the Tour of Flanders might not be the monument. <laughs> That's true. But Pedersen seems like such a weird one. Like, he wasn't firing on all cylinders at E3, you could say. But then he does really well here. So, it's really hard to tell what kind of form we're going to get him in. We do get Dwar's door, of course, in the middle of next week to get another look at him. He's on the provisional start list. It's possibly gets taken off that foot. To get more rest. Um, Vanderpool, of course, isn't taking part. Wout Van Art is alongside a very stacked Visma Lisa bike team. Wow, I actually said it correctly. I can't believe that. <laughs> but uh, well, I don't approve this message. I can't. Yeah, do that. Six... <laughs> well, no, I think that Pedersen's a hard one to gauge how he's going to go at at Flanders. You know, we were discussing how close is he to joining this Galacticos group. He's, I think, he's pretty close I think he has gone well over long distances we've seen that at world champs before I don't see any reason why Pedersen shouldn't be going really well at Flanders other than I don't know maybe Dwyer's door takes it out of him and he is just knackered for, for a really long event at the weekend but I think the main question is how you defeat Vanderpool because he's the main man that everybody needs to be trying to actually defeat and to be honest with you I just don't really see well you could say Pedersen but I don't really see anybody really beating him to be honest to be yeah, I think it's going to be hard to be Vanderpool. Um, his record in this race is just fantastic. In 2020, he won. 2021, he finished second. 2022, he won. 2023, he finished second. So that's just an exceptional record. Pearson's got a good record in this race as well, but he hasn't won it. Vanderpool's won it twice. I just think Vanderpool's got that kick in him. And I think it's hard to compare Kane Wabel Cam to Ronda because Kane Wabel is a lot flatter, whereas Ronda has is, got a lot more hills. And I think that will favor. Uh, Wout Van Aert and Matthew Van Der Poel over, over Mass Pearson. But, I mean, today in Kane Wabel it looked like, Pey- uh, sorry, it looked like Van Der Poel was kind of losing energy towards the end. He attacked really far out. I don't think he should be as sort of confident in that and attack all the way out because he saw today that, that somewhat backfired. Yeah, it did. I st- yeah, it looked like Van Der Poel was definitely struggling a little bit on that last descent of a Kemmelberg, like Pedersen was the one taking it to him. But without Poggy, in this race, if you give the hypothetical like first and second to Wout, it does open up a third place for somebody else. And I would be quite surprised if it wasn't a lead or track rider. I'm not just saying Pedersen, because I do think that Stoyven, like we've been saying, is looking really good. I think it's probably too hard for Milan, but I think Stoyven was really good at E3. You know, it's very easy to forget, but he was top 10 in that World Champs road race last year as well. 
that's just a very under the radar performance. And I think that Lidl Track have got a really strong possibility of finishing on a podium of Flanders. My only thing with uh, with Jesper Sturven is that he does not have a great record at Ronda. He's much better at Roubaix. Um, the only top 10 he's ever gotten Ronda of Vlandera was back in 2018. Um, he's competed every year since then and hasn't really cracked the top 10. Apart from, oh, sorry, 2021, he got top five, but it's, he's not very consistent in this race. So, Patrick, were you saying Wat Van Aert is for sure number two? Because he was beaten by Mass Pillars well, last year. Yeah, I'm, I'm just kind of like still giving homage to Wat Wow, no matter how much I do like to kind of like take a dump on his name sometimes. You've got to kind of give respect to the guy that he is, you know, he is a monument to winner. He is very good at cobble races. And just because of one oopsie on E3 doesn't mean I'm going to write him off completely, especially with such a strong team. I just think that Visma Lisa Bike have got to play it a bit smarter. I think that E3, they just ended up going with a we are working for WoW strategy, and that did not work, basically. Mm-hmm. I think they've got to play it a bit smarter with Jorgensen and Tratnik, who just seem to not play very protagonistic roles in E3, and I think that that was a mistake of Visma Lisa Bike. They've got to make use of their numbers, because let's face it, Van der Poel, when you whittle down the team strength, Visma Lisa Bike is stronger than that than Alpes and De Koenig. so you've got to use that advantage where you can because evidently Van der Poel is better than Van Aert on these kind of days shown by his record in this race so I think Visma Lisa Bike have got to go back to the drawing board a little bit and go back to how they did on loop and bring that to Flanders and I think that's going to be better How does much of Van der Poel win it this year if you did, did look a bit weak on the Camelberg okay it's a week out we don't know if he was just using this as a tune up as well but, I mean, yeah, my spill doesn't look strong in the Camelberg. But the Camelberg is not the most influential climb of, of the Ronde van Vlaanderen. And on Friday, Mats van der Poel was easily the best on you know, the Quarta Montan de Paterberg, which comes up in the Ronde van Vlaanderen. I think van der Poel is a lot stronger than it seemed at King Babel Camp. It's not a race that he's naturally clicked with as much as the Ronde van Vlaanderen. So I hold my sort of doubts that he's not on tip-top form. I think he is. I think he's looking really good and he can kind of win it from a number of situations here. He could win it in, in a reduced sprint. I know he lost it today in Kate Wavelham in that scenario and he also lost and he also lost back in 2021 to Casper Asgrade in that scenario. But I, I, I think he's capable of holding it in a sprint and also definitely distancing people on the other quad. So he wins a uh, Ronde van Vlaanderen, except if he turns up in a sprint with a Danish guy, then he's definitely losing. Pretty much. It's a good thing Jonas isn't here. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine that, Jonas beating. How many Danes are in the start line? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. There's a few in uh, Tudor Pro Cycling, I think he could... Oh, Alexander Camp. I'm not sure if he's going. Is Casper Pedersen going? But he could be the real kryptonite. <laughs> From I mean, s but yeah, he's done it before. No, let's be realistic. No. <laughs> the way Van der Poel wins is he just leaves it as late as possible for that final kind of double ascent of the Ardequel of the Paterberg. That's the, the killer combination. Everyone's on the knees. You stick the knife in on the Ardequel and you twist it on the Paterberg. And that's the simple combination which seems to have worked really well for Van der Poel. I think it's really up to other teams to disrupt Van der Poel before then to try and make it not just a walkover for him to try and win. If you just roll to the bottom of the Arda Quermont and try to, you know, get Wout to just ride hard to drop Van der Poel, it's not going to work. I think you've got to try and do something a little bit different. You've got to get somebody else up the road beforehand that Van der Poel, that they can just sit on Van der Poel and hopefully that ties him out so that you can drop him because it's not going to work if you just wait for him to like, oh, we're going to, he's, he's going to drop on the Paterberg because I don't think he will, to be honest with you. Um, Van der Poel, I think as long as he doesn't take Pedersen to the line, basically, I think he's going to be all right to win, win in a sprint amongst everyone else. But does Pearson have it in him to sort of hold on to Matthias' wheel up at Alvaro Cuadra Montepantaberg kind of boom attack? I don't think he does. I think Wow does. I'm not necessarily convinced Pearson's... You think Wow does? I, I don't think either of them have it, to be honest. Well, out of out of the both, I think Wow Van Aert's probably stronger. On an out of Quadamont's kind of climb, I think Wout is probably stronger than than Mass Pace. And also, his name was brought up earlier on. Casper Asgreen, have you seen his form this year so far? 
It has been uh, dreadful. So he did from today. Well, he didn't finish on low. Gunnar Brussel Kuna finished 88. Dada Bianca, decent result, 16th overall. Idri on Friday, 77th. And today, he enabled him 54. That's bleak for a man who's won Idri in the past. Wait, you what? Uh, you, I thought he was going to be up there, but obviously it was a sprint, so he probably didn't care in the sprint. I mean, a name to throw out there, who was able to follow, well, he was able to follow on the Poggio is, I mean, it's not just a meme, it is it's Betiol. Betiol, when Pagaccio went and Vanderpool followed on the Poggio, Betiol was pretty much the only person, it looks like Gallo, I guess you could say, to be able to follow that attack, and Betiol, of course, we haven't seen him at all this week, because, well, in E3, he DNF'd. For some reason, I'm still not entirely certain on. But we're going to see him at Dwar's door and maybe Batiol. I mean, he won his women's race before. I was it's almost amazing. about to say, what the F has Batiol done at the Tour of Flanders? But then I remembered. <laughs> well, well, it worked. Dis- disrespect. <laughs> Oops. This race. I mean, if Sebastian Langeveld isn't here, though, to block into the final ascent of the Paterberg this time, but. Maybe Bertillon could be a, a name. I'm just looking at the start list, just trying whoa, whoa, to find somebody. Bertillon had the legs to hold on until the end. Put some respect in his name. Casper Asgrim couldn't catch him. That's true. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, fair enough. Uh, but we'll move on uh, from Cobbles. Uh, so we have just talked a bit about Tour Flanders, etc. But in terms of the other big race that was happening, Walta Catalonia, I don't know how you guys normally feel about this race, but normally I kind of ignore it. I know. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, and even but, more so when one rider is dominating outright from start to finish. Well, last year was a bang in Catalonia because we had Roglic. From yeah, there. exactly. True. But honestly, this is a stage race I rarely watch. I think last year was the first time I ever watched a full Catalonia stage. But this year, holy ghost, it was it was something else for 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 Pocky from start to finish, pretty much. Oh well, day one he didn't win, but he was very close to winning, and then just boom, he just just like completely exploded this race. How many stage wins did he get in the end? Four, I think. It, it's just mightily impressive. And the gaps they got in the top ten of GC, those are gaps you would see in Grand Tour, like top tens in the end. And, yeah. spare a thought, Egan Bernal's first World Tour stage race podium since the g in 2021. I mean, this was a bit like, was it the Dauphiné or Basque Country last year where Vingo absolutely blamoured the field? Um, yeah, it's just, when they're not together, it's just nothing. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, I mean, just to give some context to you and like time gaps, the difference between Poggy in first and Mikael Lander, who, let's face it, this is a very good version of Lander that we saw this week, was 3 minutes and 41 seconds. The gap between Poggy and 10th place, who was Lorenzo Fortunato, was 7 minutes and 27 seconds in a stage race that is 7 stages long. Like, should we just give him a Giro now? Is there actually any point in anybody else turning up to Giro? If Poggy stays on his bike and doesn't get ill, it's going to be... What's the biggest margin of victory between first and second in a Grand Tour? We might be verging on a new record. It's probably, like, from the old days. It's probably, like, I don't know, a 30 minutes from, like, the 1920s. But if we have three weeks of this, I, I like Poggy. I think he's a great racer. But three weeks of this at the Giro? Nah. Pass. Yeah, literally. No, it, it, the Giro is in danger of being a massive GC snooze fest. And, it, it, and it's just going to be like you and you might have a massive gap of it, just go breakaway, 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 send them all. What they could do is um, give po- give everyone a head start. And it's like a little fun match where like Poggy has to like kind of go woo and catch everyone. Or maybe, like, put him on... Limit his gearing. What, give him junior gearing? Yes. Maybe he has to just, like... Maybe he's not allowed to win. I don't know. Like, just the prospect of the judo is incredibly, like, just dull and dire at, the, at this point. Ben O'Connor. Can Ben O'Connor really challenge him? No. Be real. I like Ben O'Connor as well, but he's not following Poggy up these climbs. I mean, the Giro and the Basque Country, 
in a few well next week one of us has kind of the same feel where it's like who's gonna rival bingo Giro as well isn't it's it, it's terrible isn't it already isn't we it haven't even fun. taken one one pedal stroke of, of the Giro yet isn't Roglic going to best country oh uh, well, okay yeah number 10 from the Paris East and, and Remco <laughs> Okay, okay, I take it back. Bit, and I take like it back. lots of other Basque Country has an amazing style, it's been an incredibly underwhelming profile. On it, it's, it's, it's a little bit sacrilege on a really good form. Like Alex Arambaru could win this if, like, if Jonas wasn't here, Alex Arambaru could probably finish top 10 GC, I reckon. Like, actually, like, not even joking. This is Alex Arambaroon's Tour de France. This is all he cares about in the year, is dominating Exulia Basque Country. I also just want to point out two good World Tour debut victories. Actually, well, not debut for one of them. But Martin van den Berg, he look, looked really good. He got a win here in a sprint. Uh, he's been knocking at the door for like a big win that wasn't from a breakaway. And then uh, Axelance as well got a sprint win. Uh, the current under-23 world champion from France who writes for Albison de Koenig. He got majorly shafted last year, well, the year before, when Paris Cycling Club folded. ding ling ling But at that point, when he was looking for new teams, most of the teams were full, so he became a stagiaire with, with Albison, so he wasn't allowed to go to World Tour races, but now he can, and he's already on winning ways. Okay, back to Pog, because this is a Pog clip now. Um, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Al, well, Almeida, uh, in the interview, mm-hmm. he said that uh, you shouldn't judge Pogaccia against his form last year because of the wrists. So with that strong team and everything, do you think this is the best Pogaccia we've seen? That's what I'm thinking. Because he's breaking records literally every single stage he's doing. And he's looking frightening, to be honest, when you also consider the Strada Bianchi win. My only reservation about declaring that this is the best Pog we've ever seen is that the races that he's done hasn't been up against Jonas or in a one day setting Vanderpool because I think that's really the thing is like is it sort of like are, are the results I don't want to call them like they're not like it's not sandbagging but you know are the results inflated in kind of scale just because there isn't that other massive rival there saying that I think that Poggy is absolutely flying <laughs> he is um, he is insanely good at the moment it's almost a shame he's not going to Basque Country because that would give us a bit of a Tour de France rehearsal. Poggy, why have you denied us? Why have you de- denied us of this? Like, you've just gone to the Volta to Catalonia and ruined everybody's hopes and dreams. When we really needed a Basque Country fight so we could all get a bit of a sense as to how the Tour's going to go this year, but instead, no, we're going to have to be remaining in the dark about it. Is this the best Poggy we've ever seen? I, I guess, Yes just because of how dominant he's being against all these kind of second-tier favourites. I think if you put a first-tier favourite in there, I still think he's going to beat him. Yeah, so we're going to say this is the best Poggy we've seen. I think it's, it's also just like he's he's looking so strong, so commanding. He's maturing. He's getting better with his tactics. And just a combination of all these different things. Like His team is performing better. Him and Almeida are such a good double act. We haven't seen them really... Uh, collaborate together, but they were fantastic. It makes you worry what they're going to bring at the Tour de France. This is probably the best Poggy we're going to see. But is it going to be the best Poggy after he... I mean, he's about to, to sort of dominate the Giro. But is he going to be the best Poggy we've ever seen once the Giro is done and he rolls into the Tour de France with a grand tour already in his legs? Hmm. Food for thought. He's a pr- he's going to be such an enigma. He's going to be a massive headache for us trying to predict what's going to happen at the Tour based upon a Giro, because he's just going to do the Giro and then nothing. I mean, he's going to rock up for the tour and we're going to have absolutely no idea if he's absolutely wrecked or if he's firing on all cylinders. It's just, that's going to be the really hard part for everybody to try and predict what kind of poggy we're going to get. You and actually said the, that he thinks Pogaccia is going to win Giro and Tour because the Tour really? is so front, or the Giro is so front heavy. And then the last two weeks, he can just use this, like, basically trading I mean, and then like he, he'll be fresh for the top he'll literally just be able to let breakaways go because he'll be ahead by 10 minutes by the end of stage 12 but he'll just be able to be like serve a breakaway all the time and then just mark moves yeah and I mean if he just puts in that the big moves in the first week it's not great for us but it's great for him he can get that 3 minute advantage and ride at home easy it is still a month off you know he's not going to be riding for like June competitively 
that's a great time for him to just, you know, recuperate. It's not like he's like doing racing in between as well. I think we might be overanalyzing the gap in between. It's different because he's sort of, I think mentally he's been doing other things on top of the Tour de France, whereas everyone else is just going into the Tour de France. But I think Poggy is going to be okay. He can just sit at home and watch everyone battle it out in, in um, the Dauphiné with some popcorn in his, in his little bucket. Yeah, if anyone's going to do it, it's him. Let's be honest. Yeah, it's true. Also, side note, did anybody notice how Joao Almeida can descend now? Mm. When, did that, when did that happen? What 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 kind of evil Knievel Mate Mahoric has got into him? Like on that stage one, he was absolutely flinging it around corners. I was like, what has got into him? This is not the Joao Almeida who at the Giro was losing like a minute on descent. He was on the hoods, like uh, kind of very tentatively getting his way downhill. I'm like, mm. this is a completely different Zhao. And I love it. Oh, it is looking good. I think he will be a really, really important addition to that Tour de France squad. We now just need to see how he was all right with Poggy, and then we get sort of a, another sort of flavor of what that team's going to bring. It, it might even be stronger than Vizma Lisa bike in the mountain. So that's what I'm feeling. Yeah, oh, for sure. I think they're going to arrest them. <laughs> Why don't you use a TT expert? Yeah, but Kuss was in the World Tour Catalonia. Anyone noticed? Okay, Kuss is never good at one week long stage races. I'll give him that. It's true. I mean, yeah, I think that ever since the Vuelta, everyone's just got like this massive like Kuss hype going on, and I think that we all just need to settle down. I think that take the Vuelta last year out of the equation. Pretend that didn't happen. It's like he's he was always a domestique. He he never really went for his own opportunities in stage races. So therefore, I think there was probably a little bit too much expectation on his shoulders to do something in this race when he's never really, like you and says, done anything like that before. The Vuelta's just really kind of made people rethink how set races, whereas that was quite a unprecedented result that nobody really expected. I think GC Cruz are going to unfollow you on Twitter. Well, you know what? They can join all the Wout Van Aert lovers and all the Roglic people who already hate me already, so <laughs> join the club. I will point out, Antonio Tiberi was really good this week. Um, the Italian um, sniper. We have to talk about it. He's such well, a good buy, though. Like, he was such a good signing. Well, they, they he, he, he saw the name of the race, Catalonia, and he was like, this is my kind of thing. But um, but he was looking really good. He like podium like one of the mountain stages, and it's like this guy was like kind of a bit of like a sort of hardy time trial engine, and boom, he's now become like a decent climber. Bahrain, who to thought? He's like Sobrero, but quite yes. better. Oh he's, no, he's no shame on Sobrero, like... please. Well, I'm, I'm saying that Sobrero is a better time trialist than Sobrero. Good. good, good. Thank you. You redeemed yourself. But um, Tiberi's still only 22. Like, he's still young. Yeah. So, hmm. And Chris Harper looked really good, actually, to be fair. Yes. I mean, he's been looking really good since he moved. Well, he, since he left Yumbo, he's one of the few riders who, who's actually, like, gotten better whilst after leaving Yumbo. And, sorry, Visma. Well, he was there during the Yumbo time. Come on. But um, I, I think he's been riding really well. And join him up with Simon Yates once again, and they could be a, a threatening double act. Simon Yates needs to step it up to Chris Harper's level. Did, did you know that Simon Yates <laughs> was in Revolta Catalog? Yeah, he was, actually. I saw him, his was name on the list. Was he? Yes, he was. He actually was. He just did not good. Uh, Where is I don't know why he didn't. Gary Thomas uh, was there as well. That's true, but oh, my gosh. Outside of the Grand Tours, to be fair. Simon Yates finished in 57th overall. Who, who finished ahead of Simon Yates? That's um, embarrassing. Um, Wonder Kid Ivan Sosa. Ivan Sosa beat Simon Yates, a grand tour winner in the Volta Catalonia. Um, Darren Rafferty of Ireland finished above him. Uh, um, who else could be thrown into the, the equation? Eric Antonio Fagundes of Uruguay finished higher than him. There, there are plenty of names you could pick out here. Simon Yates is doing a Gary Thomas where he only does well in the Grand Tours now. He just like sacks off any bit of stage racing as just training. Did he not win this race like a couple of years back? I think that was Adam Yates. But when he was actually tries at stage races. 
Anyway, speaking of stage races, Top Your Bachelor also happened. Uh, not many yes. people care about that race because it's quite small, but it has had some notable winners in the past. Jorn Spingo, Mar- uh, Mara Schmidt last year. And I mean, this year, it wasn't Archie Ryan. I keep thinking Archie Ryan won it, but it wasn't. It was Kuhn Bauman winning another one-week stage, well, five-day stage race for Wismut Leafs Bike and actually his first stage race outright so uh pretty cool and uh, ewan's friend marco brenner won the first stage with a very daring descent thank you archie ryan though is is the ryan is the rider that caught my attention um just 22 years of age looked really really good here uh, he won the stage at the trail of Slovakia a couple of years back and it's good to see him stepping up at the top level they have what three irish riders now at ef so good to see someone flying the flag let me let me get my passport out let's go ireland how did you even get that passport? Uh, 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 excuse <laughs> me. I didn't create citizenship law. I mean, that was that's a writer, like you said, Ewan, who left this smelly spike and is doing better. Well, he's, sure. he's fairly young, so it's a bit unfair. Yeah, it, it, it's a hard point of comparison. But they had, like, the what, the five riders in the pelt on that left, Yumbo done well. He's one of them. He's going to bus country as well. It's a rival, Jonas. Hell yes. It's former Rob teammate. Rich. It was all the secrets. Remco, exactly. He's gonna, he's gonna get, him, he's gonna get inside Jonas's head. He's, he's gonna make him uneasy. He's gonna be like, "You're not actually that good. I'm gonna be you." Everybody actually needs to be afraid of this. Whatever day, over a day in his embryo, who's taken up over KOM that Jonas takes, and how everybody oh. seems to just have an absolute obsession with. Yeah, it's a uh, KOM that's very. We I think we talked about when Pickpock allegedly took it, and then. It turned out that it was actually, he was holding onto a motorbike or something like that. The Col de Vardy, which is in, I'm saying that the Danish way, it's near Calpe and many pros use it as kind of like a gauge. It's about 12 minutes, 13 minutes long uh, for pros. And uh, yeah, this this kid from Kolo Creek, Peter Hansen, he's taking, beating the KOM now. 12 minutes and 38 seconds. Uh, the distance of the climb is 6.5 kilometers. And he's riding for Call Quick, which was the team that Jonas Bain got rode for. So he got signed in a way off the back of this KOM, in a way, uh, Jonas Bain got to Jombo Visma at the time. So maybe this means he's going to be joining Visma Lease by uh, Peter Hansen. No. No, you wouldn't sign him up. He could have been in the back of a of, 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 of a what's a Volkswagen, you know? He could have been in a car. He could have it's had like an e-bike, <laughs> like oh I don't know, like I don't like digging too too deep into this, you know? No, like, I, they filmed it, so you can see it. Oh. Oh. <laughs> I'm going oh. on mute now. Are you gonna mm. claim that it was an e-bike? <laughs> mm. <laughs> <laughs> I should do more research before we hit record. <laughs> The only problem with this is that now, like, now, Ineos are going to be like, oh, here we go, another wonder kid who we need to sign to ruin their potential, dig them into the dirt, and make sure they never get any good results, ever. Just telling. Now, outside (laughs) of just being a TT monster, which he already was, which, by the way, Ineos are just a TT expert team. So their format kind of matches up. I'm talking climbers here. Sheffield, also, you can throw about me, but he's a TT guy. But when was, like, I'm talking, like, Ineos just don't seem particularly great at nurturing or, like, getting this talent going. I feel like they always prioritise Pidcock. They always prioritise some other elderly statesmen in the team, and they don't give these youngsters a chance. Like, these youngsters would be far better doing the under-23 scene Going and doing for, like total avenir and all that, but instead Ineos pluck them far too early. I'm not just saying it's Ineos, I'm just saying teams pluck them too early. Keep them in a development setting and let them grow. Stop trying to find the new Pagacha, you know, when he's 18, because guess what? He's probably not ready to be on the world tour. Just, just, just leave him to kind of do his thing. He's obviously very talented. So just, just, just let him be for, for a couple of years. Interestingly, on this point, Jim Radcliffe did an interview this week where he spoke about um, his transfer policy for football and like what his sporting teams 
he was saying that he wants to find the new Mbappe. He wants to find the new Pogaccia instead of buying Mbappe and Pogaccia. He wants to find these new talents. And I mean, they've been trying, but shit ain't working, you know? I'm just thinking of a scenario where Gary Thomas, obviously, almost won the Giro last year. But once Gary Thomas retires, which I'm going to presume is going to be... If. 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 Whatever. He's the new Valverde. But basically... <laughs> Who's going to take it up afterwards? I've been trying to make a saying it's going to be Pidcock and Bernal. They've just got all these like Andrew Augusts, Michael Leonard's of the world, Theodore Storms, who are just kind of sat there. Who I just think would be better off not being on like a World Tour team going to random little stage races. Because I just feel like it's a waste, to be honest. I just, I'd rather. I'd, I'd, I'd rather their talent not be just be sequestered in one Ineos kind of like mega pool rather and just just, just spread them out. Ineos Grand is under 23 team. Where is it? We're still waiting. Brightcliffe said he wanted to develop talent, but he's missing out on under 23 team. So, I mean, there's some hypocrisy there. It doesn't add up. It literally doesn't. Why do they not have an under 23 team and a junior team like most other World Tour teams do? If he wants to find talent, like you says, it's completely backwards. Just actually execute on what you say. It's not like you're short of cash, I'm guessing. Just just, just do it, <laughs> please. He probably has more in his couch than it would take to fund an under-23 team for the next five years. Yeah, true. This is verging on me kind of going on a rant about British cycling, so should we, should we move on? <laughs> before I lose it again. Well, yeah, what are we moving on to? Gosh. Oh, Brugge de Pana. We ended in time by Brugge de Pana. The two fastest sprinters in the world. And almost took each other out. I don't get what Millie was so upset about. What was he What was he throwing his hands at? For Phillips? What did he think Phillipson did wrong? Nah, they were like kind of fighting for the same wheel and blah, blah, blah. Phillipson did probably like move a lot more than he should have, but everyone stayed upright. You know? That's true. I just feel like, obviously, because they were going after somebody. I can't remember who it was. But basically, like, Philipson was going up the left-hand side. Miller's going up the right-hand side. You can't just, Miller can't just be like, okay, I'm just going to, like, expect you just to kind of hit the wrist rider's back wheel and just stop. Like, he needs to realize that Phillips is going to move out. I didn't really get that. But you know what? It, yeah, but they are literally the fastest sprinters in the world. I'd say it's probably those two. Milan. Probably Milan, maybe. Okay. Yeah, Milan. Grunewijk, maybe. Really? Uh, you normally go against Grunewijk, and then now you're batting for him. Okay, okay. Uh, Milan, Koi, then Grunewijk. I mean, yeah, that that would be quite a good... It would, yeah, those four actually going head-to-head, it would have been quite good. What was Koi doing in Paris Nice? Beating Mass Pilsen. No problem. There was, there was a good battle for the place. That's Kim Abel Kevin. That's true. Jordi Maris winning that. Oh, it's Sean Zalise winner, Jordi Maris. Yeah. Yes. True. It respect. feels like he's um like you know like he's had like that that one victory will just be there forever. Like like Sepp Kuss has won the Walter, that'll always forever be there. It's Jordi Maris won on the Champs Elysee, but will he ever follow this up with an- another big victory? Well today we saw signs that he could. I mean, it's a pretty big victory to have. If you're going to have one, champs yes. Tour de France. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, like, we weren't expecting it. Can he ever follow up? Oh, it's like when Grona Baker won on champs Oh, that's not fair. <laughs> Grona Baker was, like, the fastest guy on two wheel. That's not exactly. Yeah, Did I you agree. just say was? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think that certain episode that we... Shan't dwell on too much. Took a huge chunk out of him. That's yes. very true. Yes. That's true. Jakobsen's not doing well. I don't think DS ever doing that great with the Jakobsen. It's, oh, to be fair, though, there was a crash in Brugge de Pana, so he wasn't actually really able to contest the sprint. So you can't really hold that against him. Yeah. Uh, I'm kind of surprised Phillipson didn't roll Mains for third again. Verlagen, but. Then again, they'd only lost a victory to Pedersen, so I guess maybe it doesn't matter too much to them. All right, uh, right of the week, yeah, right of the week. Mm. 
who's going first? You go, you. Well, unless you don't have a name. No, no. Okay. There's a real. There are two very low hanging fruits that they kind of touch the ground, and I'm not going to go for them. I'm going to go for Edgar Bernal. It's Bernal season, and he finished on the podium of Walter Stage Race the first time in a couple of years when we maybe thought he was going to be a meme forever. A bit like how I said, riders sometimes get branded with that one big victory. He kind of has that. But now it feels like, okay, Egan Bernal can, can start to be taken seriously once again. And that's good. I'm happy for that. And Ineos Grenadier has got a World Tour stage race podium. Wow. Again, it's quite a competitive field. Who'd have thought? I mean, considering that, uh, that crash, like I wouldn't have put it past him if he just like stopped cycling. Like, the man has enough money, moved to Colombia, like, could have left, live a fairly comfortable life for the rest of his, yeah. Mm. So I'm just I'm picking, a, picking a rider. I say okay, fine. People. I'll say Mass Pills in the, in the meantime. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm going to level again, second time. Uh, he's not going to win Flanders because of it, because of that curse. <laughs> I'm going to go with somebody who I don't think. I'll get an opportunity to say his name. Oh, it's very a pithy. frequently. It's a pithy. I think no. I'm going to go Mikel Lander because I don't think that Lander he will be a domestique for Remco a lot of the time. And you know what? It was just good to see Lander being good again. He was actually on the attack. Usually, he just kind of follows moves, but he was actually being very animating. And I think that he was he was really good. At Catalonia, and I, I was really happy to see him seemingly like a like the old Lander. Which so I was, I was really happy to see that. So Mikel Lander for finishing second in the uh, Volta Pogaccia. There was one stage where I tuned in for, and I saw Pogaccia attacking off the front, and Lander tried, and then just dropped back. I was like, well, then what's the point of watching this stage? But he tried. <laughs> That's yeah. the most important thing he tried. <laughs> Nobody else tried. They tried on the final stage to some extent, but the race was by far over by then. That's true. Even William is actually the one who put Pogacar under the most threat on, on that. Like, that is actually, he's a big guy to be threatening. Like, somebody for Liège. Like, if he's not on Liège, all the flesh will own. Um, why is Real Premier Tech doing? But anyways, that's basically it for episode 61. And uh, make sure to hit the like button, subscribe to the channel if you're new here or on Spotify if you're listening there. And comment down below what you thought of the week in cycling. And of course, as always, thank you for watching and we will see you next week.